What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. I'm the Game Digester, Ethan Rodriguez, and today we are discussing our top 10 family games for gamers. And so, um, this was a list inspired by someone who had commented on my re recent videos, a Mr. Richmond Page. Very much appreciate the comment and the inspiration. And this was a comment on a review I did recently in which we talked about this game being uh, particularly strong for a family game. And so, as part of that, he inquired maybe what are some other games that, as a gamer, I enjoy playing with the family. And so, um, really, again, appreciate the inspiration there and the comment. And so, a few distinctions I want to make as far as the list goes. So, I had some initial difficulty in deciding how I was going to frame this list because I don't necessarily think these are family games but I don't think they are next level games either. And so when I think family game, I think of games that are good for the family, yes, but may not necessarily appeal to a gamer. So for instance, I like Ticket to Ride. I actually have Ticket to Ride Nordic Countries, the two or three player only map. And it's cool, it's good for the family, but not necessarily good for me as a gamer because it is a little too lucky for me. There are other family games that um, may be just a little too light for my taste or my particular family. And so those I'm not really considering in this list, although some of these can be scaled that way. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and then I don't think they're next level games either. So when I think next level games, I'm thinking of games that maybe you exclusively could play with adults. They are not necessarily welcoming or gateway games. They're the next step, but they are not quite um, family games and maybe a little too much of a gamer game. So these, I think, strike the perfect balance between the two extremes. Uh, not that either one is really that extreme, but I think this is a good uh, middle point for what I'm looking for as a family game is something that can still be played by a wide variety of family members, but has enough meat on the bone for me to enjoy it as well as a quote unquote gamer. And so um, with that caveat out of the way, I want to address what I mean by family. So family doesn't necessarily need to be the nuclear uh, sense of the word, right? And that doesn't have to be uh, two parents, two kids and a dog. It could be, you know, one parent, three kids. It could be two parents, two kids. It could be two parent, one kid. It could be one parent, grandma, grandpa and a kid. It could be any combination Whatever your family is, I think there's something on this list for everyone and a wide age group too. So you could have young children, you could have preteens, you could maybe even have some late teen, young adult uh, children in your household or maybe no children, but you just have a multi-generational home with family members too and you are a gamer and you're looking for something to either play with the generation below you or the generation above you. Again, I think there's something here for everyone. So. With that in mind, we're going to go ahead and run through our 10 through 1, and uh, let's go ahead and start off with the first one. So number 10 on the list is going to be a app-integrated game, so already starting off with something a little more modern technology, and that's going to be Chronicles of Crime. So Chronicles of Crime, published by Lucky Duck Games, is a fantastic detective uh, problem or detective story solving one-shot game. So in the base game box, you're going to get the London Forensic Science team working on some of those serious cases. Uh, but then you have expansions that are going to fit in this box, which include the Welcome to Redview, kind of like this Archie, Jughead, uh, Betty and Veronica spin on the game. Not that theme, but kind of adjacent. And then you've also got the Noir package kind of taking you back to those days, kind of gumshoe almost. Um, little rough them up kind of uh, detective work. And so this particular entry, I will say maybe skews more towards the older family, maybe the uh, multi-generational or perhaps the preteen teen family, as opposed to uh, the parents and the young children, because of some of the themes that go on here, there are murders, of course, there's some instances of drugs and other things. I'm not going to get too much into spoilers, but uh, there is some adult content that is not necessarily geared toward children even though on the box it does say 12 plus and so if you just cater which cases you use 
to your particular family, uh, especially like the Welcome to Redview one. I think it's great for maybe a preteen, young, younger children, um, not young children, but like preteen, uh, maybe 12, 13, um, or even 11, like my 11-year-old plays it. And it's fine. You can kind of talk around some of those things that come up, especially as they enter the high school or something. They might have to experience that. And with adults, it's perfect because everybody probably knows what the realities of the world are. And yeah, it's it's a fun game with you using this app and QR codes to go through kind of a story, taking different leads, following, uh, talking to different people, going to different locations, and ultimately trying to answer a few questions at the end of the scenario to figure out how well you've scored. And so with it being cooperative in nature, uh, you do have the opportunity to collaborate with each other and work together to reach a good outcome, which I think is very good for that kind of family team building experience with your family, uh, rather than kind of kind of picking on each other or knocking down each other's sandcastles, you can go ahead and work together to solve a really cool mystery with a great hybrid between analog gaming and digital integration with the app. So uh, Lucky Duck Games did a really great job with this one. Chronicles of Crime. There are some standalone ones as part of the um, like Centennial series, whatever it is, between 1400, 1900, 2300. That's coming out soon. Haven't gotten to those yet. This is a great place to start, though. And again, something that your family can enjoy and you as a gamer can enjoy. So number 10, Chronicles of Crime. Now, number nine is going to be the race entry to the list. Uh, I'm sorry. This one is the party entry next to the race one. And race, I mean by racing. Uh, but as far as the party entry goes, I'm not a huge fan of like the Cards Against Humanity, Apples to Apples kind of games. I know those are mostly the ones that people will uh, kind of lean towards as far as the entry to their family or Pictionary. I do like Pictionary, Charades, those kind of things. Um, but this, I think, has more of a gamer feel while still being light enough to introduce it to your family. And that's going to be the game here by Blue Orange called Detective Club. So Detective Club kind of takes a different spin on the uh, Dixits of the world and Mysteriums, things like that. And I'm just fixing the box because it's backwards. But uh, in this game, players are going to get these kind of fantastical cards here that you see well, like these. And they'll have a hand of these cards. And what they'll be doing is using these notepads to write a word. Could be some silly things like Apple maybe or Mardi Gras, even a phrase. And you write a word on some of the notepads, but you leave one of them blank. And then you pass the notepads out to the other players. And everyone will look at their notepad and secretly write or secretly pick a card that they think is going to appeal to that word. However, because someone does not know what that word is, sorry, I'm taking off the board the table here too soon. Because they don't know what it is, they're going to have to bluff their way through uh, kind of the interrogation part of the um, reveal. So everybody will look at the notepad. The starting player who wrote the word will pick a card without saying anything. They'll go around the table in a clockwise manner until everybody has laid a card down. So the people who know the word are just trying to find a card in their hand that fits. If they don't have one, they're just trying to make up a story in their mind so that when it comes about down to explain it, they have already their ducks in a row. The person who doesn't know the word is kind of trying to figure out what's going on with the other players without being too obvious and trying to pick something in their hand that they think is going to fit the word. So again, once it's revealed and after everybody plays two cards, the person who wrote them will say the word was frog, for example, everyone gets a chance to kind of explain why they chose the card they did and why it appeals to that word. And so unlike like a Cards Against Humanity or a Apples to Apples or Red Flags, things like that, you take away the single judge and you kind of put the judge as all the players. And so the person who's hiding and the person who wrote the word have some incentives though as to not being too obvious or too um, obscure. They want to have somebody maybe guess it, but not everyone. There's some unique scoring opportunities there. And this game is just a ton of fun. Um, you know, you can play it still with some younger kids, maybe not your youngest because they will not maybe get the bluffing kind of part of it or how to how to come up with a story very quickly but even still you know if you've used like maybe Rory story cubes in the past and you kind of like those storytelling opportunities with your family this is really fun it gives everybody or kind of a chance to be organic and what they are saying 
and kind of think on the fly and, and just have a bunch of laughs. And sometimes you may know the word and you don't have a car that's going to fit and you just kind of have to lie off your butt to cover yourself, you know? So it's a great laugh inducing family. You're going to get a lot of chuckles. You can play for the points. You can just play a couple rounds until you get tired of it. I think it's added a little bit more than some of the other family weight games like just one that I do also have, but not too much like a Mysterium that has a lot more involved. It's a happy medium. I enjoy it as a gamer. I think it's got enough going on with the scoring and trying to figure out maybe who's who's got what tells and who's telling, you know, who can, I can tell is not telling the truth, something like that. So uh, it's just great. So without rambling too much on about it, I really enjoy it. That's Detective Club, my number nine. This is by Blue Orange Games. All right, moving right along to number eight. I kind of previewed this earlier. It's a racing entry of this list, and that is going to be Flamme Rouge. So Flamme Rouge is a great bicycle racing game, already a very unique theme, something that's very appealing if you've got fans of the family that maybe watched the Tour de France that's on right now, actually. There's a lot of drama with that if you're watching this in 2021. But um, yeah, it's a really great bicycle racing game. It's very simple. Players will get two decks of cards, one representing each of the two racers they have. One of the racers is a sprinter, goes really fast. The other one is a ruler, which basically... Um, just kind of sets the pace and goes a little high, goes a little low, but has a lot of medium cards. Uh, doesn't really have that bursting out speed like the Sprinter does. And so they're working in tandem to kind of uh, slipstream off of each other, slipstream off of the other racers involved so that they can get extra movement throughout the race and make it to the finish line first, or if there's a tie, make it the furthest across the finish line. Uh, so it's a very easy game to administer. Uh, if you have younger kids, maybe you're a seven, eight year old, it does say you can play eight plus on the box. So already family weight, I would say. And, um, for the younger ones, you may have to shuffle a lot for them because there is a lot of shuffling because you're only drawing four cards, each deck, looking at one deck first, drawing the four cards, picking one card, putting the, the rest underneath, then going to the other deck, drawing four cards, putting underneath, eventually you're going to run out of cards and have to shuffle. So if they are younger hands, uh, younger children, you may need to shuffle those for them. But as they get older, my like 11 year old now could probably shuffle it herself, no problem. Um, and so it not only appeals to the kids with the modular track, the fun bicycle racing theme, but it also can appeal to the adult because it's not that obtuse as far as what you're doing. It's ultimately like just kind of a hand management card game that is appealing as far as the theme goes. It's not real fantastical or quote unquote nerdy. It's just cool bicycle racing with some neat art and there's expansions that you can use to make it harder if you want. Even the tiles themselves, you can make your own tracks for your family. You can use the tracks that are recommended in the game. Some of the tracks have uphills and downhills and cobblestone if you have the expansion to make it harder or more difficult for the older parts of the family. But if you want to play with the kids and use the younger side uh, and just the easier stuff, you can do that too. So very modular in that sense, uh, not only with the track, but what rules you use and what track tiles you use. You can even play a full um, like Tour de France kind of simulation with different tracks over a different uh, number of plays. You can even also use in the expansion that comes with two extra racers, a six player game, even with just three players by just administering the other three players. So a great game to check out if you're into those racing type games and that is going to be Flamme Rouge. Great for the family, but again, also great for the gamers. Now, moving along to number seven so number seven is kind of like the puzzly city building entry and this is quadropolis so earlier i mentioned scaling games for younger parts of the family but also older parts adults this game does that very well uh, it's got a classic mode which only has four sections that you score in and you have four tiles of your own color and you will use each of those tiles over four rounds to build your city and you get scoring bonuses based on the way that you build your city, certain buildings next to other buildings, kind of those, uh, or maybe certain meeples on certain buildings. Those will give you points and there's shopping centers, there's apartment buildings, there's parks, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, so in the classic mode, very simple. It's a very cool little central board that you're all placing these tiles around, these architects, and you're just counting one, two, three, four, taking the appropriate tile and based on what number you used, putting it in that particular section row or column of your board. And so classic mode, 
four rounds, very short. Can be played. This box says, um, I think also eight plus. It does. Two to four players. Perfect for, you know, mom, dad, kids, parents, kids, maybe even grandma, grandpa, kids, whatever. I mean, it's not very hard to, to get set up because the inserts really got done well for that. That kind of sorts everything all together uh, based on the round and you just kind of shuffle them up and flip them out. Now, if you are playing with maybe the older part of the family or maybe you've got some preteens or young adults and mom and dad or, or parents or grandparents, whatever, then you can play the expert mode, which is five rounds, so it's a little bit longer. It's got, instead of everybody having their own tiles, you are sharing all the tiles together, playing over a certain amount of turns per round, and you introduce some new scoring tiles, like office buildings and certain monuments. And if you have the expansion, you can throw in some of these special public buildings instead of just the normal public works. And so um, when you throw that in, it really kind of appeals more to the game. The classic game does a fine job already, but the expert mode even more so. And so uh, as your family gets more accustomed to games, this is one that you can bring out that's not too heavy, has colorful enough, has great component quality, great production, and something that both, again, younger kids can enjoy based on the classic mode, can advance or graduate to the expert level as they get more uh, familiar with the game. And then you can still play the expert or the classic mode with the older, the older members of your family. So... That's a uh, winner in my book, and Quadropolis is a great game by Days of Wonder, one that you should check out. I did do a full review on this one. If you're interested, check that out on the channel, and that's going to be my number seven, Quadropolis. All right, so number six, and then we're going to get into the top five. This is another cooperative game. So as I mentioned in Chronicles of Crime, cooperative games lend themselves to be great family games because it takes away the antagonistic approach of being you know competitive with each other and you know, there's only one winner or maybe with younger members of the family you can get upset and, you know Billy's winning over Jill or Jill's beating Billy or whatever and they can get upset and you have to kind of play, play um, mediator you know you can take that away by playing a cooperative game because everybody wins together or everybody loses together and so this is a great game for that probably the most um, almost brick and mortar, like not a big box retail, I would say, store that you'll find on this list. And that is going to be Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. So I believe I got this one at Target. This is actually published by Mattel Games. Um, so this is a cooperative game where you have four players going into this haunted mansion, trying to find these gems and get out of the mansion in time before they get overrun by ghosts and hauntings. And so if you look at the back here, You've got this really nice production, this really colorful board, great little ghost miniatures, great little haunting miniatures as well. And then the actual player pieces have these little um, kind of bendy plastic minis that have little backpack slots on the back. And you can go throughout the, the house, pick up gems, and slot them into the actual miniature that you're using. Uh, and that's really cool, just kind of gimmick production that works. On top of that, this is a roll and move almost mixture with pandemic style game which doesn't sound like it should work but it does on your turn you're rolling a die one through six five of the die faces one through five are bad you're gonna have to flip a card out and put a ghost somewhere and, and depending on how many ghosts go into a certain room that are alph alphabetically ordered a through k i think it is you will put out more ghosts and if those ghosts get too overrun they'll become hauntings which are harder to get off the board if you have too many hauntings which is all of them then you will lose and so if you roll a six, you don't have to worry about that. But you're just rolling the die, maybe putting a, flipping over a card. There are some cards that even lock the doors. And then you're moving your person around to pick up the gems. And on the scaling level, with the younger participants in your family, you can just put the gems out randomly. They're double-sided with numbers. Uh, or I'm sorry, one side has numbers on them. And so you can put the numbers uh, as inconsequential. As long as you get all eight gems, you win. But you can also play so that you have to get the gems in order, which as your family grows and gets more accustomed to games, as a gamer, you can introduce that level of, of uh, the game and you can make it a little bit harder because now it's not enough just to find the gems and you'll know where they are. They're not hard to find, but it's not enough to get them. You need to get them out in a certain order, which you have to make that puzzle work. Also, there is an expansion that adds even more mechanisms. Now the gems not only have numbers, 
or they don't have numbers anymore. They have special powers and you have to, there's a separate board that you have to alternate between and getting them done in sequential order, one through 12, I think it is, or one through 10. And then there's a ghost king that can kind of do a domino effect with the ghost in the room. Normally it's three ghosts will make a haunting. Now if the ghost king goes to a room with two ghosts, it'll automatically become a haunting and it'll keep moving in alphabetical order, causing a chain effect. So definitely adds more for uh, the gamer and in, in the group. And then it's still that if they can help with that cooperation, the family can still handle it. We play this one all the time with um, my 11 year old. We've been playing it with her since she was probably eight and she does really well at it. It's super simple. Just roll the dice and make a decision as to where you want to go and work together. You know, sometimes you'll have to split up the group. Hey, we're going to go over here. If you get stuck, I'll help you out. You two guys go over there, take care of those gyms. We'll just kind of deal with cleanup. There's a lot of collaboration going on, a lot of cooperation, and that's great for the family. So great game. Um, great again for the kids. They're really going to enjoy the, the pieces. I enjoy the pieces, and I'm an adult. So um, great one again to try. It's not that long, probably 45 minutes or so. It says 30 minutes on the box. I think that's a little light. It's probably more like 45 to an hour. But again, really fun, great game. And that is Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. Great for the family, great for the gamer. My number six. All right, top five now, and number five is the only game on this list I don't have. So number five, actually my brother has, this is called Sushi Go Party. Sushi Go Party is a drafting game, very much in the vein of like a Seven Wonders, except with a much more family-friendly theme. So Seven Wonders is not um, R-rated or anything as far as the theme. It's just a little dry. It's a little boring. It's a civilization theme. Um, you know, historians and stuff might like that. I don't mind civilization, but if I'm trying to appeal to uh, the next generation of my family or the younger generation of my family, that may not work, right? They want to play something that seems fun. That's what games are. They're supposed to be fun. And so Sushi Go Party, I think, does that well. It's got this really cute Sushi Go or Sushi artwork with these little sushi pieces with faces. Um, sushi Go Party in particular has a huge variety in the game. So going back to scaling, you can play with some of the easier scoring cards, and then you can scale it up to some of the harder scoring cards that are a little bit more involved. Some cards give you just straight points based on what they are. Others will need to be majorities or in-game bonuses. Um, there's a cool little sake bottles that you use on this victory track. There's a nice recessed board area where you put the tiles in that kind of remind players what the cards do. And on your turn, you're simply going to get a hand of cards, pick one of them, Reveal them all at the same time, and they may score for you. You may have to discard them based on what the card does. And so some cards require you to be the only one who takes it. Other cards are irrelevant of that. You just kind of play them down. And it's just a really good, well-done drafting game. And it introduces that mechanism, too. So for younger kids, they're going to get a kick out of it being kind of this cute artwork. Even parents and adults, they will enjoy it, too, because it is kind of a fun little theme. Uh, it kind of teaches, again, that drafting so that players can get used to that as they get to maybe a Seven Wonders later on or a Paper Tales or something like that. It won't be so foreign to them because they'll know, okay, I've done this before. I can get a hand, take a card, pass the cards. Pretty simple. But it's still got that double thing, too, for the gamer. So the gamer's thinking, hmm, you know, I know I passed this hand over here. So they have that card that I was waiting for. Are they going to choose it now if I choose this same card the same time maybe they'll choose the other card that i left them because i don't want them to choose this one there's kind of that double thing going on um depending on how many players you have it may not get all the way rack around to you depending on the certain hand sizes so you have to really think about like what's really the best value right now it's got a lot of good decisions and it's got a approachable theme fun artwork great production that is welcoming for the family can be scaled because of the variety but again still gives the gamer something to chew on. So I enjoy that about Sushi Go Party. That's why it's my number five. I believe that one is published by Game Right. I don't have it in front of me, but I believe again, Game Right is the publisher. So there you go, that's my number five. Let's move on to my number four, which the rest of these I do have. And number four is going to be a Plan B game published by, or uh, published by Plan B Games that is Century Golem Edition. So you could say, Century Spice Road, they're the exact same game with different artwork and production. I would say Century Golem is better for the family because of the theme. Again, Century Spice Road, it's a little more of a boring theme, so maybe your older generational family members might 
be more willing to play that because it is not as fantastical and not as, again, maybe kid looking or too young looking. But um, I think if you are playing with the kids, this is great because it's got these great little gem pieces, this fun golem artwork. And the mechanisms of the game are simple no matter which way you go. So all you're doing on your turn is playing cards, picking up new cards, pick or picking up your old cards. So if you play a card from your hand, you can either get more gems, upgrade gems from yellow to green, green to blue, blue to red, or trade gems in for other gems. So if you've got maybe a card that changes two greens to one blue, you just trade your, your gems in and take them and that's it. When you pick up your card, it's pretty simple. You just pick up your whole hand in front of you and then the next person goes. And then when you want to take a card, you can either add more cards to your engine or you can pay the resources required on these golem cards to get those cards, which are points. And after so many cards are taken based on the player count, the game ends. Whoever has the most points between those cards and the coins that they may have gotten, depending on what card they took in the row, is going to be the winner. And so the teach can be super fast. But the thought behind it is uh, enough that, again, a family can play it, but a gamer can really enjoy it too. And so uh, this may be not be the first game I'm going to bring to my family. Uh, you might want to have just a, a few conceptual ties to this through other games just to kind of introduce them. But this is one, if you have played some family games with them, some early family games, they can get the set collection part of this. If you've played Ticket to Ride before, this won't be that foreign because they'll kind of grasp the concept of, oh, hey, you know, there's some cards in this drafting pool that I can take and I can, I want to get certain cards to kind of build my engine because I can collect these gems and trade them in. Very much like collecting cards, trading them for a route in like a ticket to ride. So Century Golem Edition, I think it does a great job. Kids can compete just as well as the adults. Um, my 11 year old does fine with this. I think in a recent game, she was just up there with the rest of us, in like the 50s or so, it was like a four player game. Does a great job. So, one for the whole family. I think definitely one for gamers. You can really enjoy the puzzle of building your best engine. And that's why it's my number four. So, number four, Century Golem Edition, published by Plan B Games. All right, top three now. And number three, maybe the hardest one on the list but i don't think it's that hard and so number three is going to be abyss and this is published by bombix so abyss is a beautiful set collection um card hand uh, not hand building kind of hand building game in this beautiful underwater world and so the artwork is fantastic the box says 14 plus I don't think that's accurate. I think you can play with younger kids. I've actually played this with my daughter when we first got it like three years ago. She was about eight and she did fine. I'm not going to say she did amazing. So maybe 10 plus is the sweet spot if you're going to play it. But um, if that's you know where you have your family at, this is perfect. On your turn, you're going to either explore the depths and basically you'll just turn over cards from this deck. The cards have different numbers on them or sometimes they're monsters. The person whose turn it is will need to offer that card to the other players. If everybody passes, they can take it themselves or they could push their luck and flip another card. If one of the other players wants it, they'll have to pay a pearl. And they, the game comes with these nice little cups, these perfect little pearls that are really cool currency for the game. Uh, and they can pay that to the person who takes it um, and the, or whose turn it is and they can keep going cards. Or if it passes, eventually the person can take whatever they want at the end or will have to take the last card. That's one action. Next action, you can just take whatever cards were left over from exploring the depths will be sorted into these decks at the council. You can visit the council and take one of those decks and put all those cards in your hand. Last thing you can do is just simply buy a lord. The lords will require certain combinations of those cards that we were talking about in the, in the council and exploring the depths. You'll pay those cards, keep the lowest numbered one from your hand, take the lord, and the lord will give you all kinds of things. It'll give you in-game points, but also maybe a one-time special ability, or an ongoing special ability that's available until they are blocked by a location, which will itself give you alter, other alternative in-game points. So, um, sounds like a lot going on, and it kind of is, which is maybe why it says 14+. plus. But if you are there to facilitate the game as the gamer in the family, you know, especially like they're exploring the depths, hey, you know, 
Molly's exploring the deck now. Bill, do you want the card? Jimmy, do you want the card? Sally, do you want the card? No, okay, Molly, it's your choice. You don't want it? Next card. If you can facilitate that a little bit, at least for a few rounds, till they get it, then it'll be easier to administer the game going forward because they'll kind of understand the basic concepts and be able to do it themselves. Um, and then with the other uh, older family members, it won't be that hard to grasp. It's not a hard game as far as what you're doing. It's just maybe reading the special powers, making sure everybody understands them. So this one I put higher on the list because I like it more, but I could see where this might be skewed more towards the middle to high age family members of the group as opposed to the younger kids. But depending again on your kid and your circumstances, they may be too fine with this game and, and be able to compete and you can enjoy the game too. So I really enjoy Abyss. It's going to be my number three on this list. Uh, definitely check it out. This is published by Bombix. There are other covers. There are two expansions. The expansions add a little bit more, so that kind of maybe takes it further into that next level territory. Um, but the Leviathan expansion specifically does have this cool dice rolling mechanism for the monsters, which I think makes the game a little bit better. And I don't think it's it'll be that hard to throw in. So want to check out and consider that it's going to be Abyss, my number three. All right, so number two was actually the inspiration for this list. So again, big shout out to Richmond Page for the inspiration. Uh, he had commented on this particular review, and that is going to be Wingspan. So this is Wingspan, published by Stonemaier Games. A fantastic engine building game about birds. Uh, so when we talk about games that I think are good for the family, we want an interesting theme. This one I would say is maybe more interesting for the older generation or the adults of the, of the family. You know, if you've got maybe a grandmother or grandfather who had birds in their home, or maybe you yourself have birds, or, you know, an uncle or aunt who does, or they used to go bird watching at the park or something, this might appeal to them. This might be a great way to kind of get them to the table uh, if they want to. Of course, you don't want to force anybody, but if they're looking for something that's not fantastical, not super nerdy or IP based, just something that's great to look at, maybe, um, can appeal to that kind of nostalgic thing of you know maintaining a bird or uh, visiting those bird parks or visiting parks to look at birds, things like that, then this is great. It's got beautiful artwork, beautiful production, these very colorful eggs, these very nice, beautiful artwork on the boards, uh, these cool little containers that hold all the resources. Everything's like linen finished, even the gold cards, this really cool cardboard bird feeder. It's just production through the roof, fantastic. And again, it's something that the family members can play. It's not very hard. You have four actions, play a card, buy, um, sorry, get resources from the bird feeder, put eggs on your cards, or get new cards. And that's it. And the cards themselves have a variety of power, so you'll need to kind of get past that part first. Again, maybe not one for younger kids in the family, but if you've got like an eight or 10 year old or so, I think the game does say, uh, let's see here, it says 10 plus. I think that's pretty good. My 11 year old can play it, no problem. And they're going to do well. And you can do well and enjoy your time with it with your family. So, for more information on this, I already did a review, like I said, so check that out. I don't want to get too much into it, but it's number two on my list. It's a fantastic game, great for the family, and again, great for the gamer. All right, so that brings us to number one on the list. So I really thought about putting Wingspan first, but I had to put this one first. This is probably my favorite, well, it is my favorite game uh, of this list, and it is pretty high up on my top 40. If you haven't checked that out, be sure to give that a look as well. But this game is also by Emerson Matsuchi, same designer as Century, but instead this is from his part of the company called Next Move Games, and that is Reef. So Reef actually comes in a new edition the second edition with some different colored coral pieces which might more appeal to some of the older parts of the family because the current edition are pretty bright these little yellow red green and purple pieces uh, but it's got a really cool toy factor with a really great puzzle game and so the kids and the family are probably going to love it because of that toy factor if they stack legos or mega blocks or any kind of those stacking block pieces this is going to give them that feel because these little pieces can stack four high and you can create whatever you want to try to score the most points in this little four by four grid on your board. So that's great for the kids. 
But on top of that, for some of the adult members of the family, you're going to have the puzzle of how you score because you're trying to make sure that you're scoring something every turn, whether it be a couple points or 10 points or even 20 points if you really get a cool little setup going first. You're just trying to score as much points as you can until the game ends when one of those piles of coral pieces runs out. And so, uh, again, for the kids, it's got this great appeal, great table presence, great production. If the adults maybe are thrown off by the really bright, colorful pieces, the new edition does have some more muted colors, some like purples and light blues and things like that, which are more maybe ocean friendly, um, not friendly, but ocean oriented or nautical looking as opposed to these colors, maybe kind of take away some of that toy factorness, but the chunkiness is still there. So that's an obstacle. You're not really going to get past that, but I think that's great for the younger players at the table. Also, the, the mechanisms are very simple. You're either going to take a card from this face-up display or play a card, and you can only ever have four cards in your hand. So when you play your card, on the top of the card, it's going to show you what coral pieces you need to place first, and on the bottom is going to be a unique way you can score. Sometimes you'll score based on a certain like L-shaped or diagonal or stacking pattern. Sometimes you'll score based on the uh, number of coral pieces that are showing a particular color on the top. All kinds of variety of scoring, um, but they're not that different. It's just going to be different combinations, uh, not necessarily different shapes as many. There's only a few shapes that once you figure it out, they're just different colors. And so not that hard to teach. It's going to be great as a kind of a learning tool for pattern building. And also one great thing about Wingspan I forgot to mention is the learning because you will get some geographical information on the cards and like scientific name on the cards as well for the birds. That's extra and pretty cool if you've got some maybe some students in uh, high school or something in biology learning about that. It's going to be a great plug for them. So back to this game, though. Yeah, it's just fantastic. I love this game. I think it's such a great puzzle. Um, some people might think Azul, I think, is it probably a good family game. I have Azul. I had Azul stained glasses and I actually got rid of it because I just love this one so much. Um, but yeah, this one, I don't hear a lot of people talk about it. I think it's a shame. This is a great game. My number one family game that's great for the gamer in the family. And so there you go. I had did a review on that one, by the way, too, so check that out. But um, there you go. That's my top 10 list. So let me know what you think of the list. Let me know what your top 10 or your top X looks like. Maybe it's five, maybe it's three. Um, if there's anything I missed, let me know about that as well in the comments below. If you disagree or you love the picks, let me know that also. If you have other ideas like Richmond that you would like to see on the channel, I can't say I'm going to do everything, but I'm always open to suggestions. Let me know that. Please remember to like and subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Uh, and then be stay tuned for more to come. I actually, if you're watching this when it's first published, going to be on vacation here pretty soon. So I'm hoping to get a bunch of content out during that time. I'll have time to record as opposed to just kind of having some time after my normal day job, which I do this now. So, um, or after normal day job, why I record is what I meant to say. So at any rate, that's been the list. Let me know what you think. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.